we're seeing there, Adolphus Towns. He's the chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. He's gaveling the session into, into session. Good morning, and thank you all for being here. It is hard to imagine the horror of the event that took the lives of an entire family near San Diego, California, on August 28, 2009. California's highway patrolman, Mark Saylor, his wife, their 13-year-old daughter, and Mrs. Saylor's brother, Chris, were driving in a Toyota Lexus, a loaner car that the Toyota dealer provided while their car was being repaired. As they drove along the highway, suddenly the car accelerating rapidly, he stood on the brakes, but nothing happened. No matter what he did, he could not stop the car from flying down the road faster and faster. As this car reached top speed in just a few seconds, it was all he could do to keep it under control. In a frantic call to 911, his brother-in-law, Chris, reported the was stuck, the brakes did not work, and they were barreling down on an intersection. He yelled over the phone, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, and pray, pray. And those were his last words. We now know that the terrifying deaths of this family were not caused by a freak accident. It turns out that people from all over the country had been complaining about sudden acceleration in Toyota vehicles. And what people are wondering is, will I be next? Our investigation found that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has received nearly 2,500 driver complaints about sudden acceleration in Toyota vehicles. We have discovered that since 2000, one insurance company, State Farm, has reported to NHTSA over 900 cases of sudden acceleration in Toyotas. We have all learned that NHTSA did not I worked very little about it, and when it did do something, it, its actions were very limited. Similarly, Toyota either ignored or minimized reports of sudden acceleration. Toyota first blamed the problem on improper installation of floor mats. Never mind that many reports of sudden acceleration involved vehicles that did not even have a floor mat. Now they blame it on sticky gas pedals. While I remain skeptical that these are the sole causes, the way these complaints were handled indicates problems at both NHTSA and Toyota. Since 2003, NHTSA has undertaken a multitude of investigations into sudden unintended acceleration. But there is a serious question of whether NHTSA used all of its regulatory tools to thoroughly investigate this issue. When I read press accounts about how former NHTSA officials were hired by Toyota and then held, helped to negotiate the scope of regulatory increase, I have my own doubts. In the case of Toyota, there is striking evidence that the company was at times more concerned with profit than customer safety. Toyota's own internal documents indicate that a premium was placed on delaying or closing NHTSA investigations, delaying new safety rules and blocking the discovery of safety defects. In fact, Toyota officials bragged about saving $100 million by preventing NHTSA from finding a defect related to sudden acceleration. The recent Prius, recall, represents yet another troubling pattern of 
of delay when it comes to revealing safety information. A few weeks ago, Toyota announced it would recall certain Prius models because of a software problem related to the braking system. Drivers began complaining to NHTSA about Prius brakes problem last year. Toyota knew about this problem and was already addressing it for new cars on the assembly line. But at the same time, Toyota withheld that information from both NHTSA and current Prius drivers until months later. If the spotlight had not already been on, shining brightly on Toyota, would the public have ever been told? That is a question that needs to be answered. NHTSA failed the taxpayers. Toyota failed their customers. Thousands of complaints, multiple investigations, and serial recalls are bad enough. But we now have 39 deaths attributed to sudden acceleration in Toyotas. To give that horrifying number some perspective, there were 27 deaths attributed to the famous Pinto exploding gas tank of the 1970s. In short, if the Camry and the Prius were airplanes, they would be grounded. These facts raise several important questions. Is it safe to drive these cars? Is Toyota now serious about solving the problem? Can NHTSA say the cause of the problem has been identified and fixed? What can we do to prevent this kind of thing from happening again? Can the American people trust NHTSA to ensure vehicle safety? Hopefully we will find some answers to these and many other questions today. And on that note, I yield to the gentleman, ranking member from California, Congressman Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a little housekeeping. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that Mr. Jeff Davis of the Commonwealth of Kentucky be allowed to participate in the hearing as a dais member, recognizing that there will be unlikely that there will be any time for him to ask questions. Without objection, we accept it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it is the obligation of yourself primarily and then myself to set the tone for hearings, to tee up, if you will, through our opening statements, how we view what we are going to accomplish here today. And I would like to commend you for the work you have done in your opening statement and add just a little bit more to it. I would first like to put up the a slide of the, uh, the recalls, uh, from recall to recovery. This slide shows a little of the history that the Chairman alluded to, the 1978 recall of the Ford Pinto the 1981 GM recalls for steering problems, 5.8 million vehicles. The very sad, with great loss of life, 1982 Tylenol recalls of 31 million bottles of, uh, of Tylenol pills, which of course led to the uh, tamper-proof bottles we all take for granted today. The 1996 Ford recalls of 8 million vehicles for fires, and of course the well-publicized GM recall after their pickup trucks would spontaneously explode if hit from the rear. Mr. Chairman, this is an example of companies, both auto and non-auto, who over the years have faced clear challenges. In the case of the auto companies, we expect to see them again. We judge them not by whether or not they from time to time have unseen and developed problems in their vehicles, but how quickly they respond and how they, in fact, react after scrutiny, either within their own company or from without, brings these to their attention. I will not call any of these five a success, except for Tylenol. Tylenol was a victim of other people, in all likelihood, poisoning their product, and yet they took a step that has changed uh, safety of the medicines we take for granted today. Recently, Mr. Toyota's company, Toyota Motor Cars, began airing a uh, television commercial, and I will take the liberty of using his words today. In it, they said that, in fact, good companies fix the mistakes they have made, but great companies learn from them. Today we will be asking Mr. Toyota and Mr. Inaba 
those very questions as to whether or not they are a good company or a great company. My second slide, I think, depicts one of the challenges of why prior to today we cannot say that Toyota was a great company, perhaps not even a good company, when in 2007 what we know for fact is that floor mat problems or uh, gas pedal entrapment problems were discovered in similar vehicles in both the United States and Japan. In the United States, working with NHTSA, a negotiated fix related to the carpets occurred. In Japan, the gas pedal, like the one seen here today, was shortened. In 2009, nearly two years later, we had the sad and fatal loss of life in what is all, in all likelihood and has been at least documented, reported and not formally contested to be a carpet entrapment problem of an automobile loaned by Bob Baker, a local dealer in my city, that led to this loss of life. Today, in 2010, gas pedals are being shortened at dealers around the country. It is very clear that at least at Toyota, a possible solution now seen as superior was available, contemplated and executed, but not for the very car that ultimately, the ES350, that led to this loss of life. So today, we will be asking two questions. How could NHTSA, in this modern age in which I can Google Secretary LaHood's name, get pictures from all over the world of the Secretary, to get information and bio and almost anything from databases around the globe, how is it that NHTSA does not formally have a system to know about every report, whether it is a sticky accelerator in Great Britain, whether it is a, uh, uh, a troubled system in Canada, whether it is a different but similar vehicle in Japan, NHTSA is not prepared to proactively act. Some would say that we should, in fact, add to our body of laws. I believe that both NHTSA and Secretary LaHood will tell us that our body of law is sufficient and yet modernization is required. I am delighted to have my friend and former colleague, uh, Secretary LaHood, here today because it will be on his watch that either the, Secretary or either the Department of Transportation will be a good organization dealing with these specific problems or a great organization learning from the mistakes of the past. Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, for holding this hearing. I look forward to our witnesses and I yield back. I thank the ranking member for his uh, statement. Um, at this time, we would li like to introduce our first witness, uh, the Honorable Raymond H. LaHood, Secretary of Transportation of the United States Department of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's a long standing tradition that we swear all of our witnesses in. If you would stand and raise your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. And you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Iceland and the members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the important issue of Toyota's recent safety recalls. Ever since I was sworn in as Secretary of Transportation 13 months ago, I have said that safety is the Department's number one priority. I would like to think that we have demonstrated that commitment time and time and time again when the terrible crash of the Washington Metro System claimed nine lives and injured dozens of others last summer. We quickly introduced legislation, which I would encourage all of you to co-sponsor, to give us federal safety oversight over transit something that we currently don't have. As a matter of fact, we're prohibited from, from having that kind of responsibility. When the Colgan Air Flight 3407 crashed in Buffalo, we learned right away what many of the problems were, and we did not wait one year for the NTSB to conclude its investigation. We began working with the aviation industry immediately to enhance airline safety and pilot training, holding 12 safety summits around the country. This spring, the FAA will issue a new rule to combat pilot fatigue and it has already begun to overhaul pilot 
certification qualifications. One of the hallmarks of my time as Transportation Secretary has been our work on distracted driving. For all of you with cell phones and Blackberries and other electronic devices, I want you to know that I'm on a rampage about people talking and texting while driving a bus, train, or plane, and an automobile. It's a menace to society, and we recently exercised our authority to ban truck drivers from texting while driving. Now for Toyota. The Toyota recall situation is extremely serious, and we are treating it extremely seriously. The three recalls involving Toyota are among the largest in automobile history, affecting more than six million people in the country. And I'd like to say a word to consumers. If you notice your gas pedal or your brake is not responding as it normally would, contact your Toyota dealer now. The recent recalls involved three issues. One, accelerator, pedal entrapment by floor mats, which can lead to uncontrolled acceleration at very high speeds. It is important to take your floor mats out of your driver's side of your vehicle until your car has been repaired for this problem by a authentic Toyota dealer. Second, Accelerator pedals, sticking or returning slowly after being depressed. If the pedal is harder to depress or slower to return after releasing it, this could be the precursor to what is known as a sticky pedal. If your pedal has these symptoms, contact your Toyota dealer immediately. If your gas pedal becomes stuck for any reason, steadily apply the brake, put the car in neutral, bring it to a stop in a safe place, and call your dealer. Finally, with the Toyota Prius for model year 2010 and the Lexus HS250, if you experience a change in your car's braking performance, contact your Toyota dealer. Now, I want everyone to know that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has the most effective defect investigation program in the world, known as NHTSA, its job is to investigate complaints and to look for def defects. NHTSA receives more than 30,000 complaints from consumers every year, and we take everyone seriously, we look at everyone, we don't set any of them aside, and we review them quickly to make sure that if there's a serious issue, we will, we will look at it and ultimately investigate it. Over the, just the last three years, NHTSA's defect and compliance investigation have resulted in 524 recalls involving 23 million vehicles. We haven't been sitting around on our hands. When people complain, we investigate. When there needs to be a recall, we, we, we do it. Of the 100 investigations NHTSA opens in an average year, there are currently 44 open defect investigations, five of which involve Toyota. Every step of the way, NHTSA officials have pushed Toyota to take corrective action so that consumers would be safe. Unhappy with Toyota's responsiveness to our safety concerns, the acting administrator of NHTSA, Ron Medford, and two associates flew to Japan in December of 2009 to clarify for Toyota management what the company's legal obligations are to find and remedy safety defects in vehicles sold here in America. In January, our new administrator of NHTSA, David Strickland and Ron Medford, now our deputy administrator, told the president of Toyota North America in no uncertain terms that we expect prompt action following the disclosure of the sticky pedal problem. Toyota publicly announced that recall two days later. I have been on the phone with Mr. Toyota from here to Japan, and I'm so pleased that he accepted the invitation to appear before this committee. With potential fatal defects on the road, NHTSA has pressed hard to expedite these safety fixes. If NHTSA had opened a formal investigation and Toyota had resisted a recall, that would have consumed an enormous amount of time and resources, in effect extending the period in which owners of affected vehicles are at risk. By engaging Toyota directly and persuading the company to take action, the agency avoided a lengthy investigation that would have delayed fixes for a year or more. 
Last week, I announced that we are investigating whether Toyota acted quickly enough in reporting these safety defects to NHTSA, as well as whether they took all appropriate action to protect consumers. We have asked Toyota to turn over a wide range of documents that will show us when and how they learned about these safety problems. NHTSA will continue to make sure Toyota is doing all it promised to make its vehicles safe, and we will continue to investigate all possible causes of unintended acceleration. While the recalls are important steps in that direction, we don't maintain that they answer every question. Some people believe that electro electromatic, electromagnetic interference has a dangerous effect on these vehicles. Although we are not aware of any incidents proven to cause such interference, NHTSA is doing a thorough review. We will get in the weeds on this. We will do everything we can to find out if electronics are a part of the problem. And if we find a problem, we'll make sure it's resolved. I've been assured by Mr. Toyota that it takes U.S. safety concerns very seriously and that safety is the company's top priority, and we will hold him to that. Finally, I want to remind everyone that there is a reason we investigate safety defects and there's a reason we push automakers to do the right thing. I listened to the 911 tape of the Saylor family's harrowing last moments. Mark Saylor, a California highway patrolman, died last year along with his wife and daughter and his brother-in-law when the accelerator got stuck and the Lexus they were driving crashed at more than 120 miles per hour. Last evening after I finished my testimony before the Energy and Commerce Committee, I met with the Saylor family to offer our sympathy and to offer any assistance we could give uh, to them. It was a horrible tragedy and I hope that no other family has to endure that. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by saying this. I was sworn in on January 23rd of 09. I've traveled to 36 states and 80, uh, 80 uh, cities. Everywhere that I've gone, I've talked about safety. That has to be our number one priority, whether it's in trains, planes, or automobiles. You look at any statement I've ever made, any speech I've ever given, there's always something about safety in it. We will not sleep at DOT, and we will work 24-7 at NHTSA to make sure that every Toyota is safe to drive. And we will continue to make safety our number one priority at DOT and at NHTSA. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. I uh, really appreciate your commitment to, uh, to safety. I think that's so important. Uh, let me just uh, raise a couple of questions with you uh, very quickly. Uh, the committee has reviewed thousands of complaints sent to NHTSA regarding sudden acceleration in the Toyota vehicle. Before the crash that killed members of the Saylor family in August 2009, there were almost 2,000 complaints at the time of Toyota's floor mat recall in 2007. The agency had already received more than 1,300 complaints. My question is, why did it take NHTSA so long to act? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would say this. Um, I've been in this job a little more than a year. And prior to my time, which would have been prior to January 23rd of 09, if there are issues that I can't answer, I'll, I'll get back to you for the record. But I'm gonna tell you this, 30,000 complaints come to NHTSA every year. And we look at every one of them. We think every one is important. Some come from uh, people who are driving cars some come from the industry. We look at what's going on from uh, stakeholders, people who are in the automobile business. Some Sometimes they file complaints with us. A and then when we see a pattern, we will do an investigation and we will look at it. And if our investigation shows there needs to be a recall, it will be done. That's, that's, that has been the, the work of NHTSA. With respect to your specific question during that time period, what I'd like to do, Mr. Chairman, is put it on the record 
after I really can get the facts for you? Thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Secretary. Uh, again, I, I know you, as, as all of us, you know, recognize how important safety is. So let me ask you this. Do you think it's safe to drive a Toyota today? Pardon me? Do you think it's safe to drive a Toyota today? I, 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 will, I will say this. I will say that if people check our website, dot.gov, we have listed every Toyota that is up for recall. I want anybody that has one of those cars to take it to their dealer and to make sure that it gets fixed. Right. And, they and um, we, again, we are going to work 24-7 and we are going to continue until every Toyota is safe for their customers to drive. Well, thank you for your commitment and your dedication in this regard. I now yield to the ranking member, uh, Mr. This, Issa. This is on, uh, Mr. Issa, but... Um, it just dropped off all of a sudden. Yeah, I, it's probably, I it has know. nothing to do with you, I'm sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, maybe they can give the, you the other switch one. The other, switch the other mic. See if this works. Yeah, just switch to that one. In fact, you can okay. use Okay, yeah, this one works. You can use two. <laughs> okay, I'll use two. <laughs> it's very presidential. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, uh, I'll pick up where the chairman left off. Uh, some companies, including Toyota, I'm told, you can go to their website and you can punch in a VIN, which is the one piece of information that anyone who's in possession of the car can see. At your website, you have to put in make and model. So you, you kind of have to know your trim level, et cetera, et cetera. Can you commit to us that in the foreseeable future, the Department of Transportation could, and if you agree, should, uh, have every automobile sold in America, a VIN number on file, so if somebody punches in the VIN number, they can see every recall and every piece of safety information that you know of that needs to be applied to that vehicle. Can you, yeah, can given the... G given the uh the right amount of time, I will commit to you that uh, that inf we should make that information available I in, in the simplest possible way for even people who are, you know, uh, maybe don't have access to a computer or whatever. We, we, we should make it available to people. I appreciate that. And, and a lot of my questions from my opening remarks are about what do we do proactively for the future? And I appreciate that we'll all have questions, but for you and for NHTSA and follow up questions about the past. But let me go on to another one. The, uh, currently, NHTSA, as I understand it, has 41, 42, 49 in the high year, 1,000 inquiries or complaints. And of course, the auto companies also have theirs. If an auto company reaches a certain threshold, they have a requirement to send that in, in the U.S. If an auto company has a recall in another country, they have an obligation to inform NHTSA. I understand sort of that system. Now, you and I served uh, in our past lives on the Select Intelligence Committee, so you're very familiar with what our open source uh, system is. Can you tell me today that there's any technological reason or common sense reason that, in fact, we should not, we, the United States government and NHTSA, should not be able to transparently see all claims from all of our first world partners, obviously to be arranged, and all the collateral material from all the people who want to sell vehicles in this country. Meaning, is there any reason you have to wait until there's a recall to get information? As you know, Great Britain, they didn't actually have a recall, but they had a similar sticky pedal that they didn't see as significant because they thought it only happened there on right-hand drive cars. And yet, when we were getting a relatively small amount of sticky pedals, had we had that information, like any open source uh, bringing together of information, you, an agency of the government would have fairly easily been able to have an alert that could have been sent to the, uh, the auto company for their attention and response. Do you see any reason that that's not something that should be part of a great organization rather than a good one? I, I, I agree that... Uh it, it should be part of it. I, we believe in transparency, and I, I personally think information can be very powerful. And the more, the better. Now, I, I know that you can't answer everything about NHTSA, but I think you're familiar with the, uh, 
the 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 tour i mean the uh, the uh, toyota blade sold in japan the one that had a pedal similar to this even though it was not an automobile sold in the united states in which they shortened the pedal uh, because of entrapment you, are you familiar with that i'm not intimately familiar with that mr isa well I, I would appreciate it if you would respond for the record of how in the future a similar automobile in another country that does have a change can have a change consistent in the U.S. As I said in my opening remarks, we took a shortcut with NHTSA's acquiescence and, and, and awareness. We took a shortcut on the mats in 2007 here. Well, in Japan, they reduced, they increased the clearance on the pedal. The difference is the difference in San Diego of, of that family still being alive. So that is probably the most important question I have for you is between open source information and consistency of similar or even sometimes dissimilar parts around the world. Can you commit to me that it is within your vision and authority with existing law to bring about a real change so that this will not happen again? I take your point on this. It is a good point and you have my commitment. Okay, I appreciate that. And if, if you would do us one favor, and that is if at some time in the future you do see the potential need for more authority or more uh, specific legislation, that you would also come back to us. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you again, and I yield back. Thank you, gentleman from California. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Congressman Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Uh, from arriving at this meeting today, I assume this is one of the more uh, uh, uplifting uh, uh, sessions that you have had since in office. I, I think this is probably the greatest attendance I have seen in the hallways and of the press at I any would one agree. of our occasions. Uh, obviously, we have struck a nerve, this committee and the occurrence that happened in California. I wanted to take a moment. Uh, Ms. Secretary, to congratulate you. I think I have been observing you for the last week or two, and I think you courageously exercised the authorizations of your office, exactly what this committee and the Congress expect you to do. Uh, earlier today, I was watching uh, the ranking member, Ms. Issa, on uh, CNBC, and he made an interesting proposal, partially what he has discussed with you today. And maybe if that proposal could be encapsulated into legislation with greater authority, but even above and beyond the auto industry, that we find a way, since we are in a global marketplace, to find this information, readily assemble it for deposit, and then for availability to not only citizens of the United States, but citizens of the world. And it is something we should have. I commented to my staff after I saw Ms. Aesop, I, I, I love uh, uh, Portuguese uh, sardines. But I have to be honest with you, if somebody died from botulism as a result of eating sardines, I would have no way in the world of knowing where to go, where to find out, or who to inform. And uh, it is time now that we think about the fact that we are not in a city market, a state market, a regional market, or just a national market, we are in a world market. And if anything productive can come out of this hearing and highlight, it is the fact that we take this positive action. So I make an open offer to the ranking member. I will join you in the sponsorship of authorization, not only the auto industry, but all international industries, to get this type of repository information made available and utilize the intelligence network and, and information of this country to uh, commercialize it, if we will. And to you, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I want to make the offer that uh, this has been a tragic experience, I think, for Toyota. Uh, I, I'm sure that if I were a, a, a stockholder of that company or if I were Japanese with the pride they have with that company and their 50 years of experience, this is something no one wanted to see happen. And what we have to do is handle this situation with a form of class, if you will. I hope we don't utilize this as some effort to beat up either on a foreign manufacturer or to overemphasize or exacerbate the feelings that may occur between the two nations. 
Well, we certainly haven't done that. We've all done it, we, uh, and I know that all of you feel this way. We've done it under the umbrella of safety for, for people who own Toyotas. That's a good message. If we could put that message out there. Now, what we want to derive from this hearing and from this fact is the best purposes in the world to accomplish things in the future so this can't happen or won't happen again. But on the other hand, we don't want to uh, excoriate uh, our friends and exaggerate situations that go beyond reasonableness. So I thank you for your testimony. I thank you for your attendance to this. And I pledge to you, together with the ranking member, that we'll take such action as possible to see a positive result come out. We'll of work with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, former chair of this committee. Let me preface my, my remarks by welcoming you here, Ray, or Thank Mr. You. Secretary. We've been friends for a long, long time, and I know you to be a very honorable man. So the questions I'm going to ask have nothing to do with questioning your integrity. I want you to know that. There was uh, an invitation made to Mr. Strickland to testify. And there was an article in the uh, Los, Angel An Los Angeles Times today that indicated that because of your request, uh, Mr. Strickland was uh, asked not to testify today. Is there some reason for that? Well, look at Mr. Uh, Burton. Um, Mr. Strickland's been on the job 40 days. Yeah. I've been on the job uh, about 13 months. I'm not going to have our NHTSA administrator, who's been on the job 40 days, appear and look at, I'm taking responsibility for this. As I said in my testimony, safety is number one. And I'm going to be accountable. If somebody wants to criticize NHTSA or the department, I'll be responsible for that, not somebody else. That's my job. I'm not going to duck it, and I'm not going to give it to somebody who's only been on the job 40 days. And, and uh, when I talked to Mr. Towns and Mr. Issa, it was always clear to me they wanted me to come, and I wanted to come when we, when we originally talked. So I, I don't know how that confusion occurred, but uh, that, that's the reason for it. Now, don't get it mad, mad at me, Ray. That was uh, the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> well, just because I raised the little decibel in my voice doesn't mean I'm mad, Mr. Burton. I can tell you that. Mr. Secretary, I've known you for 20 years. Don't give me that stuff. I. Uh, you know, there's, there's a question about uh, uh, whether or not there might be some kind of a sweetheart arrangement with some of the people that preceded you working at NHTSA. And uh, uh, there are a number of people, I think at least two NHTSA employees, who now uh, uh, work for Toyota. They're on the Toyota p payroll. And uh, uh, I have their names here. Are you familiar with that at all, sir? I've read the reports of that, and we've looked into it. And what the, what the law requires is that if you've been an employee at DOT and you go to work for a company that does work with DOT, you cannot communicate or participate in the work that you did with this company. So if you go to work for a company, go to work for Toyota, you cannot communicate on issues that you dealt with at DOT. So for example, if those employees worked at NHTSA, which they did, they, they can't come back uh, and um, be talking about these things. They could talk about a highway project or, you know, something like that, I suppose. But uh, and, and look, here, here's my pledge to all of you. If anybody here knows that th th there's violations, let me know. I'll refer it to the IG. Yeah. Th and there'll be an investigation. We're not going to, there has been no more higher standard set for ethics than this administration. No, I, At the first cabinet meeting, the president made it clear I don't want any ethical problems with anybody. Well, this, this preceded you, anyhow, Mr. Right. Secretary. But uh, this Mr. Chris Christopher Santushi, now uh, Toyota's assistant manager of technical and regulatory affairs. Uh, did work for the agency, and uh, according to General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, they don't have anybody that's for formerly worked for NHTSA that's uh, that's working for them in, the, in those capacities. But you're saying that these gentlemen that uh, went well, to no, work they they can work for Toyota, but they cannot come back and talk about issues that they worked on. They can't do that. They they could talk to people in other modes, 
FAA or some other mode, but they cannot come back and talk to our folks about issues that well, they... Well, the one, one thing I would suggest is, is that the appearance is one of the things that right now I think the public is very concerned about. And a couple of people that worked at NHTSA that go to work and they're in, in a public relations uh, position, they can talk to people at NHTSA and the appearance uh, may be that uh, they're influencing some decision making that's going on. So I look, look at I, I agree with you on this, Mr. Burton, and, and I think this law probably should be tightened up. I, I really do because I agree with you. Perception is reality. Anybody that's been in politics knows that. And, and I take your point on this. Well, thank you very much, and I still love you, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, you're back. Yeah. And I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Representative Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. LaHood, Secretary LaHood, it's good to have you here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we find ourselves in, in quite a dilemma here. On the one hand, as Mr. Kanjorsi has said, we want to be very careful about what we're doing here um, because we do have our, our number one, uh, one of our main trading partners. Uh, Japan involved. On the other hand, though, we have the safety of citizens. Uh, many of our constituents who spend thousands upon thousands of dollars to buy uh, an automobile, and, and they have a right to expect to be safe. And to that end, uh, yesterday there was some very uh, telling testimony uh, before the Commerce Committee, and I'm, I know you were there and heard about it, uh, where the president of Toyota Sales USA, uh, when asked about the uh, mat issue, whether the sticky pedal or the, 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 the mat problem, whether uh, recalls in regard to those issues would solve the problem, he uh, was not sure. Are you familiar? Yes, sir. I, I, heard, I was there and I heard his testimony. And you know, as I sat here and I listened to you and you talked about, you, you said go to the website and you said if they were people were having certain problems, they should go to the dealership. And then I heard you, in answer to the chairman's question, um, I don't think you ever really answered the question because he asked you whether or not you considered a Toyota to be safe. You are our safety guy, just as you just said. You said it. I didn't. And I believe that. I believe you are concerned about safety. The question still becomes for our constituents, you as our safety guy. Well, let me answer you very directly, Mr. Sure. Cummins. Thank you. For those cars that are listed on our website, dot.gov, for recall to go back, those are not safe. We've determined they're not safe. All right. We believe that we need to look at the electronics in these cars because people have told us they believe there's an issue and we're going to do that. We're going to have a complete review on the electronics. But for now, any car that's on the website needs to go back to the dealer to be fixed. Now, we've determined that those are not safe right. because of a floor mat problem, because of a sticky pedal and 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 uh, it's the end that I'm wondering about. Right there. Is there no, in other words, you just said you didn't consider those safe. But again, we had Lentz saying yesterday that and and just I'm not trying to attack you. I just want to make sure we're clear. Oh, look at I'm not offended yeah, by but, any of this. Come on. Okay. I'm not. But 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 we need to be clear. We got people who are driving these cars every day. And I'm just wondering, do you believe that and it sounds like you do that there's something beyond just those two things as Mr. Lentz of Toyota USA testified to yesterday. And well, and, and and if and, and there's one more question. Yep. If those automobiles, if there are automobiles that are not on the recall list, because that's what I'm, I'm beginning to wonder about, what are they supposed to do? There are people who believe that there are electronics problems with Toyota, and that's the reason we're going to do a review. Okay. And for now, we don't, I'm, we don't have evidence right now to say conclusively that there are these electronics problems. Well, we're going to get into it. We're going to get in the weeds. There were some people at that committee yesterday that, that had some uh, uh, studies that showed that there were electronics problems on at least one that was tested. We want that information. 
And do For we have now, a time? The only, the only thing I will say to the Toyota drivers, if your car is listed, take it to the dealer and get it fixed. And please know that we're going to look at some other issues because we've had complaints about the electronics. Now, have we, do we have enough personnel to do that? In, yes, sir. And, and, I, and I will tell you this. The President, in his budget, proposed 66 new employees for NHTSA. We have a, 125 engineers, and we do have electrical engineers also. The answer is the President has proposed in our budget 66 new employees for NHTSA. And when you look at NHTSA, and you talked about looking at problems, you said and when, a, when you see a pattern, can you tell us what a pattern is? In other words, what you said if you see a pattern, then you take the next step. In other words, I, I would say, you know, if we get, uh, I don't know, say we get 50 complaints on an automobile, say we get 10 complaints, we look at those seriously, and if those 10 complaints appear to be serious, We'll, we'll begin to look into it. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank the gentleman from Maryland. Um, I now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Micah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, when I received the notice for today's hearing, I, in fact, this, I guess, is from the committee. It says the uh, panel of witnesses would include David Strickland, the administrator of NHTSA. Uh, I, I know he's only been on the jobs for a limited number of days, but I think it's important that uh, he testify. I'd ask unanimous consent that uh, he uh, be allowed to testify and be sworn in as a witness. As it was explained earlier that uh, the Secretary indicated the fact that uh, the decision was made that he's been on the job 40 days, and that's the reason um, he's not here. Well, but the Secretary also assured us that the decision in terms of the final decision was his and that he's prepared to assume that responsibility. I so once he said that, uh, I, I became very comfortable with it because if he's uh, uh, going to yes. assume the responsibility, and then of course when we discussed it um, with the ranking member, uh, we accepted that. And of course I think that we should just move forward. Well, I, I do understand that he is here and he is available. Um, I. I never met him before, but I read his resume, and it said, uh, uh, this is from the uh, department website, it said that uh, his work included, he was with the Senate Committee, I guess, in advising the Commerce Committee members, uh, led to his inclusion of several significant vehicle safety mandates, including the electronic stability control mandate for every passenger vehicle. So he does have a certain <coughs> amount of expertise if we're going to look at uh, uh, the safety of equipment, uh, I think he, it, it appears he uh, not only is knowledgeable but has also had experience in p uh, passing uh, legislation or uh, influencing regulations in that regard. So um, I can withdraw my request, uh, but uh, again, I, I'm disappointed that he is not, uh, uh, he is not a, a witness, and I was led to believe again uh, that he was on the witness list. Would the gentleman yield? Um, well, I, I don't want to. I will yield. For Thank you. I'll very be very briefly brief. On this, on this Mr. Point. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're anticipating having another panel in a week or two. Uh, would you agree to work with us on the possible inclusion of uh, Ms. Strickland? Because, of course, we're going to be calling probably Bush administration people, and we can we can see the the potential of that uh, at the end of this hearing. I don't have a problem with that at all. Because let's face it, what we're talking about happened on the other watch. I mean, uh, and of course, uh, uh, and we need to recognize that. So uh, the point is that I think that's where our emphasis should be in terms of trying to make certain that we talk to them. But I don't have a problem in terms of at some point asking Mr. Strickland to come forward and to, uh, uh, but the point is that I think we should just move forward today. Uh, we have the Secretary uh, with us, and, uh, and I think well, that he's I will indicated. withdraw my uh, motion uh, if it's acceptable. What? And uh, we'll work with you. but. Uh, and then, if, five if I'm now recognized, I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes. Uh, NHTSA is um, the primary national safety transportation, surface safety transportation agency of the United States and the Department of Commerce, uh, right, Mr. LaHood? That is correct. Yeah. Um, Every account I've heard to date says that 
NHTSA failed and Toyota failed. Uh, the chairman said it in his opening statements yesterday. We heard that. Uh, I'm sorry I can't talk to the NHTSA administrator today, but we will get an opportunity to hear from him. Uh, you opened your commentary, rightfully so, with safety being your, the primary responsibility of uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, correct? Uh, That's correct. Yes, um, and you set, now set the policy, and you've been there for a number of uh, months. Um, so I'm somewhat baffled by the budget request of the administration from 2000. Uh, 10 to 2011, the, the budget request that came out a few days ago, with the smallest request for increase in budget for our primary safety agency, it was only $5 million. And, you know, yesterday I said in, in uh, the Transportation Committee, uh, my dad used to say it's not how much you spend, but how you spend it. You spend it wisely. But I think you know the concern Mr. Oberstar and I have had about. Uh, safety and uh, making that a, a priority, particularly in transportation and in NHTSA in particular. But um, it's a relatively uh, modest uh, amount. In fact, it's uh, one of the lowest increases requested. Uh, any reason for that? We think that uh, adding 66 new people at NHTSA probably gets us where we need to be in terms of really uh, staying on top of well, our have, safety issues. You have 632 current positions. How many vacancies do you currently have? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on the record for that. Uh, does Mr. Strickland know? Maybe Mr. Strickland or staff? I'll be happy to get note? back to you for the record. Okay. Uh, and I would like Mr. Chairman to ask unanimous consent that, that uh, the number of FT TE vacancies in uh, NHTSA be included uh, in, in the record. Without objection. Uh, the issue of uh, the revolving door of people going from NHTSA to the industry, uh, uh, it was stated that there's no communications that what you stated allowed between them. I have a copy of an uh, email in 2008 between uh, Scott Yon of the U.S. Department of Transportation and the former uh, a former NHTSA employee uh, who works for Toyota, are you aware that this type of uh, uh, these types of communications uh, went back and forth? I saw that email. Well, you did admit that we should tighten things up. I think that was your term. Absolutely. And is there now a two-year ban or a one-year ban? Are you familiar with the restrictions on the revolving door of uh, two-year ban? Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I would be glad to hear your recommendation and support your recommendation to tighten this. But I'll be happy to work with fact, you on Mr. it, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit this uh, this document for uh, to the record to show that in fact there has been uh, communications uh, uh, and that we do need to close the revolving uh, door uh, if it's just limited to uh, Toyota. Uh, Without it objection. It, thank you. It doesn't matter. So uh, I do have some disappointment. Uh, again, I don't want to get into all the specifics of where those bodies uh, are directed or requested. Uh, it's not my intention to try to embarrass the department. It's my intention to make certain that you have the resources uh, to the, do the job that you need to do to in, ensure safety. Is there anything else you could recommend to either our transportation committee or government reform in the way of additional authority, personnel, or resources that would allow Regarding you safety? Yes. I'd love for every member of this committee to co-sponsor the transit safety bill that uh, Mr. Oberstar introduced. That's a good way for, to give us the opportunity to have oversight over transit systems, including WMATA, which had a terrible crash, which sparked our interest in really getting into the safety business. Well, and I would encourage every member of this committee to look at that bill. It's a good bill, and it gives us the authority, which we're prohibited from doing, to get into the safety business with respect to transit organizations. Well, and transit is one thing. And again, uh, federal agency has say over Amtrak and freight rails, which have uh, probably the uh, worst uh, safety record. but. If you took all the uh, fatalities in public uh, transit uh, over the uh, years uh, and compared it to the one 
the incidents that have been cited today in this one uh, automobile part, uh, I think you, you, we have a problem. Mr. Mike, I don't minimize any fatality. I think one fatality is too, are too many fatalities. And when eight people are killed here in Washington, D.C., on America's metro system, somebody needs to be looking out for safety. We want to do that. And I hope we can have your support to do and it. Finally, I would, uh, yeah. I would venture to say and, uh, there's an article in today's uh, uh, post that uh, if, they, if we had, we do have equipment that, uh, that could provide that safety rather than spending on a bunch of people wandering around the tracks. Uh, we, our money would uh, well, best, best be uh, expended. You'll be happy to know the president sure. has proposed $150 million in the 2011 budget for WMATA. And for equipment. And the gentleman's and time has expired. $5 million dollars for it, NHTSA, uh, the NHTSA budget, uh, the lowest amount that I have uh, in recent history. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from uh, uh, Ohio. But let me just say before we do that, uh, we have three votes. Uh, and of course, um, um, we're going to continue through the votes. So I just want to assure, assure you of that. So you, as soon as you vote, you need to come right back because we're going to continue. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized I, I, for five minutes. I thank uh, the, uh, the chairman. Uh, welcome, Secretary LaHood. Thank you. Uh, CBS had an uh, exclusive where they were able to gain some internal documents that showed that Toyota redesigned software in 2005 in response to complaints that cars were accelerating unexpectedly. Are you familiar with those documents? No, sir, I'm not. Uh, is this uh, the kind of, of issue uh, that uh, NHTSA has the uh, ability to be able to, um, to get into? Yes, sir. So are you interested in that kind of, uh, of a report? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the suggestions uh, made in that report is that the, uh, by an electrical engineer, is that there may be a problem with systems design with respect to Toyota, and uh, I, I would assume by reference to their electronic throttle control. Does your department have the, uh, the technical ability to be able to analyze uh, systems, design, engineering, mechanical, software, hardware, and all the elements that would be necessary to be able to come to a conclusion as to what the nature of unintended acceleration would be? Yes, sir, we do. And, um we take our responsibility seriously. We have 125 engineers. We have electrical engineers. We're going to get into the weeds in a very thorough, comprehensive review on the electronics uh, because that issue has been raised enough that we need to do that. It's been raised by people who drive Toyotas. It's been raised by members of Congress, and we're going to do it. Uh, the distance between Washington and Japan is well established, but the question is, what kind of ability do you have to send those who have the technical skills to analyze documents to Japan to get Toyota's cooperation in being able to review records of research from, let's say, 2004, 2005 on these models, internal documents that would tend to show whether or not Toyota was aware of any of these problems. Do you, uh, do, have you s sent people specifically to do that? And if you haven't, do you intend to uh, as part of your uh, findings and your investigation? We have asked for a voluminous amount of information from Toyota, uh, which I, we will review. If we need to go to Japan and meet with their engineers and get more information, that will be a part of our review. And so, uh, but, but you uh, no doubt are aware uh, that as a uh, established uh, and, and respected automobile manufacturer that Toyota would have research documents within their control 
that would show the function of various uh, components of, of their system. Yes, of course. And, and I think this is important, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chairman or Madam Chair, uh, that uh, we hear from the Secretary on this uh, because uh, uh, his department does have the ability to be able to get into this. And while we as members get these documents, we can analyze them, we have help in being able to, to understand. Now, in the time that I have remaining for the uh, instruction of the membership and the public, could you walk us through how complaints are investigated? You know, who does the investigation? Uh, can you uh, enable us to, to, to learn, uh, is this all in-house? Do you outsource any of your investigations? Almost all of our investigations are done in-house by our experts. People uh, file complaints with us, and we take them seriously. We look into them when we decide that this is serious enough. We interview people. We look at all the possible uh, written material from the automobile manufacturer, from people themselves, uh, from who are, we, we gather the most comprehensive amount of information through interviews and research and then make a judgment uh, if, uh, if a car needs to be uh, recalled. Well, I may, uh, thank you, and uh, Mr. Uh, LaHood. I just want to make sure that you put on your agenda uh, the, uh, the issue of the redesign of softwares, uh, software by Toyota engineers in 2005 because we want to see uh, if Toyota's claim that electronics were not to blame, uh, we want to see how that squares with the software uh, redesign that occurred apparently in response to some kind of an electronics problem. If, if it's on our radar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Time has expired, Mr. Secretary. I want you to know the chairman has not morphed into a lady in red, <laughs> but he's gone to vote, and uh, I am here uh, pending the vote of the Congress to give the residents of the District of Columbia the same vote. Uh, that your constituents had when you were here making trouble uh, and doing good. As a uh, former member, I supported your opportunity to do that, Ms. Norton. And we certainly will miss your vote when the, when, <laughs> when the bill comes up. Uh, so I thank you, uh, and the members will uh, reappear. Uh, I call on next gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and Mr. Secretary, I, I want to say I, I've always appreciated your intelligence and your feistiness. It's how you arrive at truth, and it's the only way we get at truth. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. Um, that uh, first, let me say so nothing's misunderstood. I don't represent uh, a Toyota district. I represent a GM district. Fort Wayne's the proud uh, manufacturer of the Silverado and Sierra. My manufacturers uh, supply all auto uh, companies, but mostly the big three. But this, is, this whole uh, ruckus about Toyota has, has bothered me personally in, in watching this uh, process. 100% risk-free is your goal, but it's not really achievable. It's not achievable on bicycles or, or ice skating or horseback riding or anything. You try to get that, but uh, we've kind of held them up to an artificial uh, standard here, and I'm concerned that even just like by dragging Mr. Toyota through this or asking you questions like, are you completely 100 percent safe in a Toyota? What are you supposed to say? That, um, that it leads me to ask a couple of questions that you may not be answer, able to answer all these today, but I'd really appreciate looking at this because this needs a thorough looking at and a fair looking at and not acting like it's just one car company. Uh, one is, is that no vehicle is 100 percent safe. Isn't that true? Our goal is to uh, make sure that vehicles are 100 percent safe, Mr. Souter. But no vehicle is 100 percent safe. Uh, our goal okay. will continue that, to make sure that so cars are 100 percent safe. Secondly, you said that uh, all Toyotas that are on a safety recall should, uh, you obviously can't, uh, you're even less confident of their safety if they're on a recall. Wouldn't you encourage people, if they have a safety recall on any of the car companies, of which you said this is one of the largest, but not the largest. Any course, car company uh, no, that has a safety Of course, recall. absolutely. In the last three years, 23 million cars have been recalled. From all and the, the vast, And the vast majority of them have not been Toyotas. Thank you. For so anytime there's a recall, 
people should take their car in and get it fixed, of course. Yes, and, and that's very logical. Right now, the kind of whole world media is focused on one of the, the companies, and I just want to well, make sure Well, I can that give you a whole list of cars that are on, on recall, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Souter, and I'd be happy to do that for and, the record. And isn't a, uh, I'd appreciate that, and isn't um, one of the challenges here um, is, is that I know from my district, almost every supplier supplies all the big three. Some are, are we don't have enough suppliers anymore to be unique in, in the United States, and most of them supply some of, of Honda and Toyota. And one of the things that strikes me here is that you should find out, not just looking at Toyota, but where is a common supplier? And if that supplier was supplying just to Toyota, as opposed to other suppliers, if it's supplying other companies and it isn't occurring there, what would be the unique thing that's happening in Toyota? And I don't have a confidence right now that that's uh, occurring, but I would think it's kind of a basic uh, research question right now. You represent a, uh, did represent a industrial district too that had uh, companies, and I think that's a, a fair thing. Now, we also have a question of the difference between a, uh, first let me ask you, you agree with this, right, that there, some is sudden acceleration and some is slow return. Yes. Yep. And that the, the deaths, which have dramatically increased since all the publicity, the, the allegations, but the proven number was 14, then it's gone up to 39 that are now in question, uh, and more coming, were all related to the sudden acceleration, not to the slow return. The slow return, I think you correctly said, is a potential danger, but the sudden acceleration, every single one of the deaths related to that. That's correct. And that um, this is, the CTS is one of the suppliers, uh, they're not in my district, they're in Joe Donnelly's, but a lot of the people work in my district, and in visiting them, they had the slow return and they were first fingered by Toyota, but in fact it wasn't, none of the parts on the sudden acceleration were actually made in the United States. They were all Japanese suppliers. And that I think we need to, rather than, than uh, we need to look comprehensively by model and start to look at this unique supplier question because that, for example, CTS supplies several different companies, uh, whether those Japanese suppliers in fact supply other companies as well in this kind of supply system. Uh, another thing that I would uh, appreciate more uh, uh, detail on is, is that um, one of the things that I'm worried about happening in the regulation is, is that uh, it was just stated a number of times that Toyota was, was looking at this and they were researching this and uh, Europe had different standards so they started to do that. One of the dangers here with the lawsuits and particularly watching what's happening to Toyota sales right now is around the world they're getting basically, in my opinion, uh, smeared, possibly justly. I mean, I don't, I don't really know all the details yet, but they're getting attacked before all the evidence is in, as I just suggested in the suppliers, that part of the question here is, will we in fact have a discouraging impact on companies doing, checking out every concern if it's going to be drug into the public eye, that documents are going to be released, whether it's this committee, I'm not accusing you, but this committee may be responsible for that, uh, before all the evidence is in. And one of the, the challenges here, we ran into this in the, the, quote, trailer controversy in FEMA, which now clearly has not been established, but had this big bubble. We said zero toxins, and then we find out this room had more toxins in it than the trailers. We're finding this in orthopedic devices. We're finding this in all kinds of things that we kind of react. And then the companies are afraid even to do the research. The, the bureaucrats and the organizations require more and more paperwork. We drive prices up because all vehicles and all parts are a combination of what's convenience, what's price, what's the tolerance when you go to 99.9 .9 versus 99.7. Uh, there's cost to the consumers. Or we could, if we all drove 20 mile an hour, we'd have fewer deaths. And that in this process, are you at all concerned that we're in fact going to silence research by the manufacturers and increase risk or increase costs or other types of things? Not at all. I think what we'll do is sensitize uh, manufacturers to the idea that safety has to be their number one priority and until they get to that point, they, 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 should, only, they should manufacture cars where they can tell the driving public that they're well, going to be safe. Wouldn't, wouldn't lowering the speed limit to 30 Pardon me? Wouldn't lowering the speed limit to 30 save a lot more lives? And you don't Well, the research it's a doesn't show that. A, I mean, look at on an interstate highway, we have minimum speed limits. You're not going to... That, look, look at Mr. Souter, that's not a very good illustration. Lowering the speed limit on an interstate highway to 30 would, would make it very dangerous. The reason you have a minimum is because you have a maximum. 
If you lowered the maximum to 30, you wouldn't need a minimum. The point being, you, I don't can, buy your argument, you, can, you can save lives with other types of things. The question is, what is the trade-off of lives, convenience, uh, so on? We've, we've seen this in horseback riding. We've seen it in skateboarding. That you have a difficult job. Your goal is 100 percent. But we have to have some balance here between risk, cost, and benefit. Madam Chair, I, I mean, if I could just respond. Our job is not for people who ride horses or skateboards. Our job is for people who drive cars. And our goal is that when people get in a car, they want to make sure it's 100 percent safe. We're not going to sleep until that happens with Toyota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Now, uh, Mr. Secretary, I recognize that this problem started perhaps as early as 2000. You have only been in office uh, less than a year. Uh, but I, my question really goes to going forward. You have, you've, um, I think, been a stand-up uh, secretary. Uh, you haven't cast blame uh, to those who came before you. Um, I am interested in uh, uh, the capacity uh, of the agency. And I use the word capacity. We have talked about 16, uh, uh, sorry, 66 new people. That sounds good to all of us, particularly in this climate. It sounds responsive. More troubling to me was uh, news that uh, Toyota's engineers and uh, technology experts were simply not there, that, the, that uh, NISI didn't even have people capable of doing the technical work that would have been necessary to look closely at what Toyota was doing. So when you look at these 66 people going forward, are we going to have uh, experts in the agency that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Toyota and anybody else? How are you dividing up these new people so we know we have people with the technical capacity to do the job, as apparently was not the case because you have engineers from Toyota saying to the press, I didn't know how to do the work that was necessary in electronics. We will find the climate that we are in today with the economy, I, I have no doubt we are going to find the very best experts that we can to fill these positions and we will resource them in areas where we need them as quickly as the Congress passes our budget. And, you, and in, in, in division of labor, uh, as experts versus other kinds of people, the, there were missing experts, were there not, uh, at, at NITSE during the yes. last few years? Yes. So in filling the gaps, are you focusing on these technological experts, these engineers, these uh, people, yes, you yes, may be out yes. of Yes, we will fill the positions with people where we know we really are, where the direction our, our investigations are going. And what we see is the, the way forward for um, looking at uh, complaints. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I've, I have to ask you about the notorious culture of secrecy that um, even uh, is admitted in Japan. Uh, and whether or not issues of competence and candor came together, um, encapsulated in a culture which apparently was not as open as uh, some would have it. Have you had difficulty penetrating the Toyota culture, uh, which teaches that these are things that should not be aired in public? Yes. How are you penetrating that? Uh, well, we've had, we've had some issues, and that's the reason when uh, the acting administrator, Ron Medford, came to me and said, I need to go to Japan to talk to these people directly. I said, get on a plane tonight. And he went, and he talked directly with the people in Japan. And uh, I, I picked up the phone and I talked personally to Mr. Toyota. And I told him these are serious matters. They need to be taken seriously. And as I said earlier, I'm pleased that he accepted the invitation of this committee to appear here. I think that begins to build the kind of communication and opportunity for people to really talk to one another about how we solve these problems in the future. 
Well, let's take a sticky pedal issue. Um, we now know that Toyota, because Toyota has said that it knew of this issue as early as uh, 2008, um, but it didn't decide to make those changes uh, in the U.S. until over a year later. Is it accurate that they did, that knew about it and over a year delayed in making the necessary changes? And how, how did they justify that uh, to your agency? Madam Chair, I'd, I'd rather just uh, give you the details for that for the record, if I could, rather than getting into the specifics. Uh, you'd like to say that again, Mr. Chair? I'd like to put that on the record so I can be very specific about the chronology of it and how it took place. Uh, Mr. Secretary, that really is going to be necessary. It is that lag which makes everybody driving a Toyota today wonder whether or not in a few months from now they'll hear about another recall that they should have heard about uh, prior to that. It's very important to get that on the record as soon as, as you can. I understand the, necess the necessity to do so we'll with do considerable accuracy. Um, and meeting with the committee uh, staff, uh, officials from your agency said that Toyota had been dragging its feet. Now, th that's, that's in quotes. Uh, that's from the staff. Uh, when it comes to working with your agency to solve the issues, do you believe that Toyota has been slow to respond to safety concerns raised by the department and by NHTSA? Yes, I do. That's the reason we went to Japan. That's the reason I talked to Mr. Toyota directly. That's the reason we've had these discussions. Uh, do you believe now that the, the candor and the rapid response that you are demanding you are receiving? Uh, in other words, it, that this, this notion that, that if you take your time, that was apparently a part of, of the culture of Toyota, these things will work out, that when it comes to these cars, that that will not be tolerated, that somehow the other, what, what they say to you, you now can trust? I said yesterday at the other hearing, uh, Madam Chair, that I think the business model for Toyota, where they have some very, very good people in North America, very good people, uh, their issues may not have always been communicated or heard uh, in Japan. But I, I do think that the fact that Mr. Toyota is here, that he's testifying, that he's willing to answer questions, uh, things have changed. His visit here has been a game changer. Very important for Toyota owners to hear that the game is really different now. Mr. Secretary, however, I'm looking at a big ream of paper uh, and I must uh, congratulate your new administrator because it was sent apparently only on February 16th. He's not been in office very long, as you indicated. But they contain over 100 questions, as of now, seeking information uh, about this crisis. It, it would lead us to believe that even now you are somewhat skeptical about what you're hearing from Toyota because you had to send a whole ream of entirely new questions uh, to Toyota uh, about uh, uh, what appears to be this uh, whole set of, of issues, even though you have penetrated very deeply already and gotten countless recalls and countless um, information uh, anew from Toyota. Um, what is the meaning of having to send so big a pile? These are three separate letters from different uh, parts of NHTSA. What, what, how are we to interpret at this date the necessity to get this much new information from Toyota, or is it new information? Some of it will be new information. I made a judgment and a decision that we would do the most comprehensive review going back as far as we possibly could to get information so we can make a judgment about whether they were forthright, whether we had the information, whether we were making judgment calls based on everything we had. We need to see all of that so that we can determine if Toyota was forthright because we have the ability to issue penalties if they weren't. But before we decide that, we want to make sure that they give it all to us. And did we get it all to begin with? Now, how common is it to have to send 
so many, such a big pile of letters so late in a controversy to get uh, the information that's necessary. I mean, you've had recalls, you've had, this is, what's new about this is, is recurrent, recurring, almost rolling recalls. We felt it was necessary to d really do the total comprehensive review of this to so make sure we get it right. Let, uh, let me ask you about what you believe happened to a company who stole the thunder from other companies, uh, and most especially companies in the United States, based, it would seem, initially almost primarily on the safety and quality of its product, built a reputation of products that were so thoroughly and uh, done with such high quality, uh, were so trustworthy on the road that the rising star was Toyota and we have automobile companies in the United States in receivership essentially, owned by the United States. Um, one of the things it is very hard for Toyota owners to understand is how that stellar reputation uh, so quickly, or was it quickly, um, got lost so that you would now perhaps rank uh, Toyota's among the worst uh, of uh, automobile companies in terms of safety and reliability. What did they do wrong that got them to this low point in what had been a very uh, lofty uh, and well-regarded uh, history well, of operation. Uh, uh, Ma Madam Chair, I, some of what I would say would be conjectured, but uh, certainly on the safety side, I think that um, Toyota became a little bit safety deaf. And uh, I think as Is a result- Is it because they, they were so big? Uh, well, I, I, look, I, I, don't, I don't really want to conjecture on these things because it would just be my opinion. But on the safety part of it, which is something I think we know about at DOT. I do, be, I do believe that they were uh, safety deaf. And I also believe their business model for communicating between North America and Japan needs some change. Be uh, meaning that Japan calls the shots even in North well, America? Just that they need to listen to one another and hear what one another is saying. Well, let, let's take the override systems. When we talk about quality, the kind of quality one would expect of Toyota, even if uh, one didn't expect it of other companies. Apparently, uh, when it came to brakes, other companies did have override systems in their uh, vehicles. Uh, that would have allowed them to be easily stopped. Uh, why? Why? I'm sure you've asked Toyota, why wasn't override, which apparently was common enough to be in other makes of cars, why, why did they not do override in the Toyota? Mr. Lenz, uh, the CEO of Toyota, announced yesterday that they were putting this override uh, capability no, on a number. Oh, you betcha. <laughs> yeah. Pardon me? You betcha, after loss of life. But, yeah. uh, but since, it, since uh, this, was, this was not something they had to discover, what would have left, led a company of such reputation not to include that override when it was already included in other makes of cars? Well, I'd, I'd just be conjecturing on that. Well, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Toyota maybe well, can answer Well, that. maybe we do need to ask him, but I must say, uh, Mr. Secretary, unless we can discover why Toyota decided to throw overboard the kinds of safeguards we understand would have been in early Toyotas, we, 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 we won't be able to make sure they're not doing it. In other words, ultimately, brake overrides, we're going to have to say whether everybody should have brake overrides. And we're going to have to know whether those kinds of things get left out of cars because people are trying to save money, because people are trying to keep up with the competition. We got to know why. That's not a small thing. Uh, and, it's, and it's a matter of some genuine, I think, uh, skepticism and curiosity uh, on the part of all of us 
Now, one auto consultant in a recent report said in here, I'm quoting him for you, Mr. Secretary, regardless of the causes of sudden acceleration in Toyota and Lexus vehicles, it is apparent that the automaker's first step should be measures aimed at protecting the public. The implementation of a brake to idle override feature across all model lines and years may be a significant step uh, in that direction. Do you think that uh, such features should now be in all automobiles, Mr. Secretary? You know, I'd rather base that kind of a judgment on good research and, uh, and, and, and a number of things. And uh, I'm not going to uh, – we need to really look at that, Madam Chair. I can't, I can't render a judgment on that at the moment. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I wish you would take a look at it because I think now everybody is going to want to know what is the minimum safety equipment that should be in every automobile so sold in the United States. Uh, <laughs> let me go on to another series of questions. The committee has an email from NHTSA investigators and Toyota from January of this year. Uh, it, 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 there's a reference to an accident that occurred in Texas, and NHTSA's request to download data from the event recorder in that vehicle. From reading this email, it would appear that NHTSA is unable to download uh, this data on its own without Toyota's presence. Is that correct? Um. We have over uh, 7,600 uh, EDR files in our crash data. The commercial available tool only reads GM, Ford, Chrysler. Toyota has a proprietary EDR, which is the system that only they can read. Why is it proprietary? Why only they can read it? Uh, there is if only the other, one. The, it's not proprietary for the others. This is what I mean by the culture of secrecy. It's ours, even though these, these kinds of things are made known by other automakers, we're not going to do it. What, I mean, would we allow that kind of, would your agency allow that kind of secrecy on that kind of important matter to continue? No. I'm pleased to hear that. Should there be a federal standard there, do you think? Pardon me? Should there be a federal standard? Well. Uh, l let me get back to you on that. Very important. We need to know what the standards are. Right. What the new standards are, and you recognize, uh, Mr. Secretary, that I, all these questions are, yes, based on what has happened, but based on going forward, because that was on their watch, now you're on your watch. Right. Um, do you believe that Toyota should make the uh, black box data more easily available to law enforcement and yes. NISPA? Thank you. According to testimony that, that we're going to get later, I understand, NHTSA has a standard that allows companies to choose whether to install black boxes in cars and requires that any installed recorder track certain types of information. Some experts have suggested that we need a federal safety standard. I'd like to know your opinion uh, on this matter. That's something that we're, we're looking at. Could I ask you, Mr. Secretary, how long it, you think it will take to come up with a basic safety standard for all automobiles? I hear we, we're asking you some questions uh, which you certainly cannot answer until the Toyota investigation at the very least is, is, is over. I am now, I think, speaking for people who are driving Lexus and Toyotas about uh, whether they can expect that the agency, doing its due diligence, will come up with something that means I've been driving on an unsafe automobile. That's why the time factor turns out to be important on this. How long do you think it will take us to know, or NITSPA to know? Yeah, rather than giving you a time, uh, Madam Chair, I'd rather get back to you and, and give you a, so that I can really, we can figure this I out. I wish you'd uh, give us an, an understanding just how difficult that is. Right. I mean, when I look at this ream of new material, I'm not yes. asking you not to go through it 
right. not to do all you need to do. Right. But I am thinking about how many nervous folks are out there wondering right. if they'll be next. Madam Some Chair, would you mind if we took a brief recess? <laughs> uh, one of the upside, the, maybe the only advantage of you not having a vote is that you can uh, uh, continue asking me questions, and I wouldn't mind taking a restroom break if you don't mind. And, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Secretary, in light of, of uh, your great patience in being here while I sat alone asking you questions, I could hardly refuse you. Ten-minute break. Thank you.